welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to delve into retro computer storage by taking a look at this and this, the zip drive and jazz drive from iAmiga. Now, in the second half of the 1990s, the zip drive in particular was a very popular form of removable storage. So let's go and take a closer look. Now, here we have a three and a half inch floppy disk, which has got a 1.44 megabyte formatted capacity. And by the mid 1990s, this was by far the most common form of removable storage being used with personal computers. But the capacity was starting to become a constraint. And so many companies started to develop what became known as super floppies. Things like the SuperDisk LS120, the SyQuest EZ135, and what became the market leader via the zip drive. And the zip drive was introduced by iAmiga in late 1994. And as you can see, they came in these rather nice uh, covers. You could have these in, in your pocket and they'd be nicely protected in your pocket or bag or something. And if we open this thing up, here is a zip cartridge or a zip disk. And if we maybe put it down next to a floppy so we can compare the two, the floppy, as I said, had a capacity of 1.44 megabytes. The zip drive, when it came out, had a capacity of 100 megabytes. Now I say when it came out because by 1998 iAmiga introduced a 250 megabyte zip drive and by 2002 a 750 megabyte zip drive. But to be honest, most zip drives ever sold were this 100 megabyte capacity. Now the technology here is pretty much the same. If we flip these things over, you'll see they're both on the back have a sort of spindle mechanism to engage their single internal flexible magnetic disk. Uh, and the real difference in terms of form factor is you might be able to see here the floppy is a lot thinner than the, than the zip drive. Zip drives are sometimes called a beast floppy disk by some people I knew because they were much, much thicker than the, the, the floppy disk. And uh, basically, if we have a look here, we can see inside there is the, um, there's the media itself in the floppy disk. We open the window at the top, you can see it glinting there. Whereas in the zip drive, it's accessed through the top. There's a little siding thing here. You probably can't see in there, but inside that slot, there was access to the, the, the disk media. If you're thinking to yourself, how did they get such a higher capacity? How did this have 70 times more capacity than that based on the same technology? The answer to that is it had a much higher density magnetic coating, much higher quality magnetic coating on the, the disk inside the zip drive. And that enabled it to have a much smaller drive head, to get more tracks on, on, on the, the disk itself. And also it had a much better um, head positioning mechanism being used with the zip drive. They basically optimized everything for floppy to make the zip drive work. So the zip drive was a very successful product. It remained in the market very strongly throughout all the late 1990s until about 2002, 2003. And then by that time, it had a lot of competition from things like writable CDs, writable DVDs, and from USB drives were coming in. And also we had people using this thing called the internet to actually exchange files. So eventually the zip drive did fall out of favor. But for sort of five, six, seven years, it was a very important part of computing, history computing heritage. So that is clearly the cartridge itself. Let's now go and have a look at the drives, the hardware, which we actually write to and read from Zip Media. The hardware used to access Zip Media came in two formats, the internal versions and external versions. So these are Zip drives. And just to say, I now have a terrible habit when I'm talking about this stuff to refer to these things as zip drives, which of course is incorrect. This is a zip disk or a zip uh, media or a zip cartridge, whatever you want to call it. But I tend to call them drives. Sorry about that. Doesn't really matter. I suppose worse things happen at sea. Anyway, let's turn our attention to what are really the zip drives, the pieces of hardware that uh, we put uh, these things into. And let's start with the external version. This is what I always in my head think of when I think about uh, the ZIP hardware. And uh, this is one of the very first ZIP drives to be imported into the UK, uh, one of the first batches which I got in very early 1995. I was working on a book called Management Strategy Information Technology. I needed a means of storing all the data, so I used a ZIP drive for that. And uh, these could work both ways up. You could have them up flat or you could have them up uh, like that. You could stand them vertically on your desk to save a bit of space. Although personally, I always thought it just seemed a bit uh, safer, a bit less uh, like to cause errors if we ran them in the, the horizontal position. Now, external zip drives came with a variety of different interfaces over time. Although the first ones all had what was called a SCSI interface, a small computer system interface. 
And SCSI was very common on Macs at the time, not common on PCs, so you had to fit a SCSI card in your PC to actually use the initial zip drives. And if we look at the, uh, the back of them, you will see the, uh, the SCSI interface. And as you'll see, there's actually two connectors here because SCSI worked in chains. So you could have multiple devices on one SCSI chain. So you've got a connector here, which actually uh, is going into the zip drive. And then you've got a connector here to go out to other devices. And on a SCSI chain, you actually had to set the ID of each device. So there were physical switches for that. You can see a switch here, it can be a six uh, or five. You only had two choices for the zip drive. And you also, when using SCSI, had to have termination at the end of your chain. So you had to have a device which was a terminator, or you had a device like this, like the zip drive, which could be set to have active termination with a switch there for active termination if you needed it. And if you're thinking setting up and using SCSI was a bit tricky, it took a bit of time, it did. It was nowhere near as easy as other interfaces. And indeed, in time, iMega introduced, I'm sure, to access the mass market, external drives like this with either a parallel interface, which in fact had a simply a SCSI to parallel converter internally, and they eventually actually launched USB zip drives towards the end of it, the life of this technology. Now, as you may be able to see, this drive has magically come to life. Filmmaking uh, Hocus Pocus has been applied. Just because I want to be able to put a drive in, show you how that uh, went in. Very, very clunky, solid technology. Doesn't sound terribly well, that drive, actually, but there we are, it's gone in, and uh, something's happening. Well, not a lot, it's clearly not connected to a computer. Let's just eject it. That was a good solid ejection noise, wasn't it? Anyway, this I'm afraid I can't connect to a computer because I don't have any computers around with a SCSI interface. So let's turn our attention to the uh, internal zip drives like uh, this one we have here. Uh, this connected via an IDE interface, so the same interface that was used to connect uh, hard drives and uh, CD-ROM drives and things at this point in the computing history. And uh, these were made, interestingly enough, not just by iAmiga, but also other manufacturers made these. I remember having a Panasonic internal uh, zip drive at one point in time. And uh, I have great memories of this technology because I was responsible, for example, for fitting these in all of the computers in my university department back in the, sort of the late 90s. And I remember ringing up a supplier at one point in time and saying, can I buy 150 zip drives? And he thought I meant these things, the cartridges. I went, no, no, I mean the actual drives themselves. I think I then rang up and ordered 500 cartridges, so he was a bit surprised. But uh, we used to give all of our students one of these at the start of the academic year to store all their work on, rather than giving them uh, a, a floppy disk. And it worked very well indeed, but uh, this was long before we had sort of network stories for students, things like that. Anyway, those are my memories of uh, this technology. But uh, the good thing is that I've actually got one of these in a PC which still works. So I think we can now actually test out for real an internal zip drive. So, here we have the only computer I've got left in one piece which has got an internal zip drive actually installed. So let's turn it on. This machine says on the front it's a 386SX20. It isn't. It was actually built in 1998 in an older case. It's got an AMD K62 inside it, uh, which is running, I think, at 450 megahertz and has got, I think, 192 megabytes of RAM. Yes, if we look on the screen there, you can see the, the RAM check going on, taking rather a long time. I should say I'm recording this by pointing a monitor at a screen, so the quality isn't ideal, but it's the only way I can record this uh, rather older almost, what, 20-year-old PC? Can't believe this is a 20 years ago, but there we are, look, we're arriving in Windows 98. Always good to go back to an older classic operating system. And it's arriving there, hopefully, in Windows in a second. The machine's making lots of clunking noises and this sort of stuff as things come up. Feels a lot more mechanical computing um, from uh, 20 years ago when computing feels today. But there we are, we've arrived on the Windows 98 desktop. I can remember making that uh, graphic all those years ago for the, for the background. Anyway, with that all fully uh, come up, we'll go back to the machine and put in the, uh, the zip cartridge, which just uh, clicks in the front, good solid uh, click there, and a little light comes on, tells us it's alive. And uh, if we go back to the, uh, the desktop, obviously some activity there, Windows is doing. Let's just go to a My Computer. Open that up and uh, look at the time it takes to find its drives and things. You can see computing was a bit slower. And if we go to the zip drive there and we go to uh, Properties, you can hopefully come up and see uh, the disk there is. Uh, there we are, definitely an iAmiga disk. And we can look at the drive and uh, 
tells us to drive this. It has a, a nice bit of software to support the thing. Let's go to diagnostic, see if it actually still works properly. Just click a diagnose now. I spent a lot of time doing diagnostics on the zip drives in my day. Will we get a green light? Yes, we did. The drive is absolutely fine. And uh, we just open it up. This, I think, is one of my old teaching drives, so let's just uh, do that. Oh, there we are, look. Uh, CIB 2003. Let's open up a very old PowerPoint file. And uh, oh, it's having a go. And uh, wow, look how long it takes to load a PowerPoint file. This is um, computing from a very different age. I don't need to show you a speed test on this drive. This says everything, doesn't it? This is a hardware lecture from years and years and years ago. There must be some images in this to uh, have taken it so long to load. Look how, how, it, how it goes through. It's just not, not as nippy as a computing today. Oh, it was about, look, tablet PCs from, from a different age. Anyway, there we are. We've seen a machine running with a zip drive. Let's uh, eject the drive. We can get back to uh, my computer. And I think we can do an eject from uh, there. And uh, hopefully, big solid clunk as it comes out. There we are, removed. And uh, I'll just also show you turning the computer off because this was a little bit different today. If we do a shutdown and uh, shut down there, it doesn't turn itself off fully. You get to that point. It's now safe to turn your computer off. We turn it off ourselves. That's what computers used to do. Anyway, that is the end of our retro computing demo. As we've now seen, zip drives were very useful high-capacity floppy disks. But they didn't offer a very high data rate, and the capacity was still limited down to normally 100 megabytes. And therefore, in 1995, iAmiga followed upon the success of a zip drive by introducing the Jazz drive, which has a much greater capacity. So here's a Jazz drive in a, it's a slightly different type of box, a very, very protective box. If we open this thing up, there you are, nice noise there, we'll take out a Jazz cartridge. And if we put that down maybe next to the zip drive to compare the two of these, uh, the main difference here is the initial zip cartridges were 100 megabytes, whereas Jazz was one gigabyte. Although by 1998, uh, Jazz cartridges also came in two gigabyte capacities. And uh, I have to say Jazz was a much more minority storage technology. I knew hundreds of people, probably thousands of people over the years, who used zip drives in their work and studies and things. I never met anybody else other than me in my circle of people I knew who actually used a Jazz drive. It was just me. I talk about Jazz drives to people and they go, what are you talking about? Because we've never heard of those. Now, Jazz drives didn't just offer you greater capacity, they were much, much faster. And the reason really was the technology. The zip drive was basically based on a high capacity floppy disk. There's a flexible media inside here, but not with a Jazz drive. This effectively has got two hard drive platters, solid platters inside it. And it engages with a drive mechanism in a much more robust way. You can see compared to say the thing on, on, on a zip drive there, very, very, very different. Spins at much higher speed. And uh, we have to go to the front of the thing, you'll see accesses by this little sort of mesh, this um, not mesh piece of metal. And so if I try and pull that back, which of course you really, really, really shouldn't do, but if I do that, you will probably see glinting in there, there's the two platters. And the heads went in there and engaged with that and gave you that fantastic high speed access. I should probably just put that back again. Now, one of the reasons Jazz remained pretty minority was the cost of them, but also the interface. You could get both internal and external mechanisms, but they were all scussy. There was never USB or parallel versions of the Jazz drive. And here I've got uh, the mechanism I had in, in my computer. I don't have any means to show you if it's working because I haven't got a scussy interface on anything that's working these days. But uh, this is a Jazz drive, less interesting on the top. Much more exciting, look at all the components, isn't it? It looks very, very exciting that way on. And if I show you down like uh, that, you can see on the front, that's where the uh, actual drive went in. I can maybe put it in a little bit. I'm not going to put it in very much because if I do, I will never get the damn thing out again because uh, it'll click in and it, we haven't got power to get the thing out. That's where it went in. And uh, on the back, we of course have uh, the connector, which there is the SCSI connector. So there we have the, uh, the Jazz drive, which is uh, for me, a, a piece of technology people forget. They don't seem to remember that jazz drives were around. People always remember the zip drives. But for me, the jazz drive was just an important piece of storage technology.
Today, one of the most popular forms of removable storage is one of these, a micro SD card. And at the time of making this video, the highest capacity micro SD card is 512 gigabytes, which means that one of these can store 5,000 times more data than the original zip disk. And yet, I still have a lot of time, a lot of respect for the zip disk, not least because this was one of the last magnetic disk based storage media to enter the mass market. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you see there, please pass that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.